he came on to me and I was able to like kind of weasel my way out of it and get out. Um, that was my first brush with just the military and kind of sexual harassment. When I was in basic, um, drill sergeants were known to sleep with the trainees. I wasn't, I did not personally witness it or was it um, on me, but um, they were known. When I deployed, I was in a clinic. I worked to call, I was a combat medic. And so um, I had this interest for working in, you know, for looking at gruesome things because I wanted to see the good stuff, you know. And um, I, asked one of the surgeons that was there. I said, hey, is there a way that I can go to the operating room and watch a case? He's like, okay. Next day he came and he's like, do you want to start working there? I was like, yeah, sure. I started the next day at seven um, o'clock in the morning. And uh, through that whole deployment, I was harassed like every single day. I dreaded every day I went to work because this person <laughs> would, catch me alone or like catch me in a hallway and like like push himself against me with his hands behind his back and i can tell you it's extremely difficult to do your job proficiently efficiently and correctly when there's someone that you have to look out for your own people your own you know your own comrades your own supervisors so Basically, what he was practicing was quid quo pro. You know, I, changed, I transferred you to the operating room, so therefore, you need to give me something back. Um, it never got to a physical point because he knew exactly what he was doing, and I never reported it because it was just, I knew command wasn't going to do anything about it, so there was no point. Um, this person was in a person of a very extremely um, important position. And he had transferred me over, and all I kept thinking about was if I speak out, it's going to be my word against him. And I'm just an E4. I'm a specialist. So who are they going to believe? Are they going to get rid of the guy that's making all the decisions and saving lives, or me, the disposable specialist? Um, you know, and a lot of people say, why did you report it? You know, it's so easy. No, it's not. You know, you're you're looked at as a snitch for turning around and talking um, about your brothers and sisters and comrade, you know, and comrades that you're working with day in and day out. <laughs> I joined trying to do something for my country, and I joined, you know, trying to be patriotic. And um, the last thing I would have imagined would have been joining an organization where, um, by my own peers, by my own comrades, I would have been harassed in that way. Um, thank you very much. This war has cost us many things, most of all the lives of our precious children. It has cost us the lives of Iraqi people, thousands and thousands. We paid for this war in many ways. We paid for this war and lost jobs and services that billions of dollars of our money that billions of our money could have created. The funds that went to war were no longer available to meet our needs at home. Instead of serving the common good, as government should, the Bush administration, with the support of Congress, took our country to an illegal war. They did so over the objections of the world community. They did so in violation of international law and our treaty obligations. In 2007, the decision to go to war cost us $137 billion. There are many things that we could have done with $137 billion in 2007. Hired 2 million music and art teachers, or pay scholarships to 22 million college students, or build 13,000 new elementary schools, or place 18 million children in a Head Start program, or hired two million elementary school teachers, shipping containers, windmills, doctors, nurses, and houses. With $130 billion, we could have hired two million port container inspectors. We could have hired three million public safety officers, or built one million affordable housing units, or provided health care for 39 million adults and children. This occupation also cost the American people $720 million a day, or half a million dollars every minute of every day. 
According to the American Friends Service Committee, this figure is averaged daily, total for the real and present future cost of the war. So far, Congress has appropriated more than $560 billion for this war. When you add up to all the real costs, including lifelong medical care for injured veterans, plus interest on a huge debt created by the war, placement of military equipment, and other future costs, the war and occupation have a price tag of over $1 trillion in the first four years. In this slide, you see the devastation of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. So when Hurricane Katrina and Rita hit, emergency equipment and the forces to operate it were sitting in Iraq, unavailable for rescue and, re and reconstruction in Louisiana, Mississippi. Funds needed to rebuild areas devastated by hurricanes were lining the pockets of Blackwater and corporations like Kellogg, Root, and Brown, and giant corporations like Halliburton. The war created four million Iraqi refugees. It also turned out hundreds and thousands of Americans into refugees in their own country. Three years after the devastation of Katrina, most of the people displaced by Katrina are still living in trailers or with relatives all over the country. In this slide, you see children. What has the war cost us? Health and well-being of our children. For the cost of $1 a day of occupation, we could provide 400 children with health care, or more than a million with free school lunches for a year. 46 million of us go without health care, and thousands of poor children are being pushed off the federally funded shift program. Between, between years 200, 2002 and 2006, dozens of federal programs were cut, programs like Head Start, community food and nutrition programs, youth and job training, affordable housing, materials and child health care programs. 37 million of us were poor in 2005. Today, 35, 37 million of us are poor. Thank you very much. And I need to show the Iraqi families, the American ordinary people, no support the invasion, no support the war. And like Iraqi people lost the member in the family, American people lost the member in the war. I have a opportunity to meet with the families in Iraq, lost two, three, four, five members in the same time. And these people opened the door and opened the heart and give me a beautiful welcome. When my son died, I put very crazy. Carlos, entering the fire, I have the other reaction. I have a grandson, Jesus have a baby, only 16 months old. Everybody crying in the house. And my baby watched the everybody and no understand what happened and cry. And I got my grandson and go to the park and play with him for his smile. I don't have opportunity for cry for my son. I don't have opportunity because the government told me your son died with the shot on the head. It's impossible you see the body. We not pay the funeral for you because you chose the civil cemetery. It's impossible you see the body because the face is destroyed and it's not good for the family. More I understand the military system of the government lied me. My son not died when they received the shot on the head. Jesus died when I stepped the illegal American cluster bomb and waiting for two hours for medical assistance and died. He no have opportunity. I miss my son. I cry every single day for Jesus. It's five years. The next 27 is five years my son died in Iraq. But when I come in here today with Iraq veterans against the war, and I see Camilo, 
and I see Juan, and I see Jeffer, I see Jesus. This is my new family. This is my boys. My sons and my daughters is here in Iraq Veterans Against the War. <laughs> but this is only the one story. Carlos is the other story, two stories here. We have almost 4,000 stories today, five years. How many more stories you need and how many more blood need the American people for a stand up with the Iraq veterans against the war, with the families, and say, bring the troops home now. How many more years? My name is Zoli Peter Goodman, formerly known as Petty Officer Goodman, United States Navy, V-1 Division, Air Department, USS John F. Kennedy, CV-67, HUA. The war ends every single day for our soldiers because someone is discharged from the United States military every single day. They're discharged with no assistance into the VA system. Some people are discharged without knowing that they qualify for veterans benefits like I was. Um, many people are told to join the military that you will receive health care, your family will receive health care, your dependents will receive health care, and no one can take that health care away from you. September 2005, I was on a training operation deployed out of Jacksonville, Florida. We were underway. My wife was pregnant with my unborn child. While I was on that training operation, my wife began the horrible process of a miscarriage. Being home by herself, the first thing she did was try, call the TRICARE hotline. TRICARE is the healthcare service that's provided to us in the military. The lady on the hotline told her that she probably already had lost her child and that there was nothing they could do. She asked for an ambulance and she was told that if she had $1,500, they were willing to send an ambulance. Not having $1,500 on the salary of an E4, she chose not to get the ambulance. And she called uh, a friend of mine and waited for him to come pick her up at our apartment and drove her to base. There's a hospital on Naval Station Mayport. It's called the hospital at Naval Station Mayport. And uh, she arrived there at 4 p.m. She went inside and the nurse told her that they were closing at 4.30 and they couldn't help her. She insisted to see a doctor. The doctor told her that they could not help her and she was turned away. And she once again waited in the parking lot while she was bleeding for my friend to take her to another hospital 23 miles away called NA, the hospital at NAS Jacksonville. No ambulance was provided. Nothing, no assistance, and we lost the child. She sent a Red Cross message to me on the ship. Upon receiving the Red Cross message, I requested to take leave. I went home on leave with no assistance, no plane ticket. Um, the money that I did spend on a, on a plane ticket to get home left me in a, in a very hard position with a wife who needed health care that I could not provide for her, and neither could my government, apparently. Later on after that incident, I was discharged with no access to the VA, no assistance with help into the VA. Um, finally finding out that I qualified for veterans health care, I found the application online filled it out and sent it in to be processed. The processing of this application took several months. I don't know how many because I lost track of time, but it was at least three. Upon requesting mental health and mental help um, over the phone, I was told that I could not get an appointment for three months and I did not make an appointment. Uh, a few days later, I looked up the law, and the law says that the VA only has a 30-day maximum to provide an appointment for someone requesting an appointment. 
So I called this wonderful organization back and I cited the laws of our wonderful country and I was given an appointment and like every other appointment that I've ever had from the Veterans Administration, it was 30 days later. So after going through this process, the first thing they tried to do was medicate. We know therapy was recommended, medications were recommended. They gave me three different medications. The first was Trazodone, the second was Paxil, and the third was Gabapentin, a generic form of Neuron. My doctor did not give me any information on these medications. He told me that PTSD treatment is not a science, that there is no science to it, and that you can mix and match these medications and something may work for you that doesn't work for another vet. So I left my appointment that day and I went home and I did research on the medications that I was given. And I found out that the main side effect of all three medications is suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendencies. And that's disgusting. So now I get to go to a 15 minute therapy session once every 30 days. And when I show up to my 15 minute therapy session, there's 15 other Vietnam vets that have the same 8 a.m. appointment that I do. And we all wait around the lobby Every single one of these vets is there seeking help and treatment for the same thing that I'm seeking help and treatment for. And they're all 30 years older than I am. They've been in the system 30 years longer. They've been taking the same medications for 30 years, the same therapists for 30 years. And they're still there and they still have the same problem. So obviously it doesn't work. 10,000 Iraq war vets have committed suicide. My name is Zoli Peter Goodman. I'm a proud warrior and a prouder patriot.